So um, I think my, my talk, uh, a lot of, if you were here yesterday and, and today, I think there's a lot of detail, a lot of advice, a lot of very you know, useful, practical things that people have, have explained. Um, and the last talk was no exception. I'm going to go a bit bigger, because um, I'm a bit bigger. So, um, uh, so this is me. Um, I am currently the European editor of Gigaron, which is a big Silicon Valley technology news uh, blog. Um, before that, I was the main technology reporter at The Guardian, where I worked for nearly 10 years. Uh, in London and San Francisco. Um, I've written for the BBC, Technology Review, Wired, blah, 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 lots of other people. But um, I'm also the co-founder of a new journalism startup called Matter. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur as well as um, a journalist. Uh, um, it's like a publishing startup. Um, we went to Kickstarter a couple of months ago and raised $140,000. Um, we, we, in, I think, in two days, we became the most successful journalism public, uh, project that had ever run on Kickstarter. So we're trying to do that, and we'll launch it later this year. So that's me. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how you win the future. So lots of people, you know, basically, I hear the same stories wherever I'm traveling around Europe, talking to European entrepreneurs, startups, people with ideas. I hear the same kind of stuff. You know, most European entrepreneurs feel like this. They feel there are lots of problems in the way. There are lots of things that they have to overcome. Uh, there's no risk-taking in Europe. There's not enough capital available in Europe. There's not enough uh, markets too fragmented. Lots of countries. How do I do it? I don't want European entrepreneurs to be like that. I want them to be like this. You know, I want them to feel the sweet taste of victory and, uh, and go ahead and do something. But there are, some, there are some things that I think we need to think about um, because what happens, what's happening in Europe, there are lots of successful companies, and we just heard about a ton of them. But I think you know, we, we're often trying to play the same game as everybody else. Now, I think that's wrong. I think you have to forget Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley's been doing what it does for 50 years. You can't be better than Silicon Valley at being Silicon Valley. That's just stupid. You know, what they have there, they've had several industries, um, you know, microchips, um, hence the silicon. Everyone always forgets that's why Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley. But, you know, silicon chips through to uh, personal computers, through to the internet and, and websites. You know, you can't beat them at that stuff because they've been doing it for a long time. They're going to they're gonna destroy you. You can't be Facebook. Even if you were, that's winning now, right? That's, that's winning today. And I don't think winning today is as, is as useful as winning tomorrow. So... What, you, what I think Europe has to do, and wherever you are, if you're in Lisbon or if you're in any other place, I think you have to think about what's next. What things do you attack that are coming down the line so that instead of trying to be Silicon Valley, you can be the new Silicon Valley. You can, you know, Lisbon could be known as the place where you know, such and such an industry is born and created, and that's where everyone goes. Everyone's envious of Lisbon. Everyone's envious of Berlin or London or wherever. We have to think about what's next. And obviously, you know, it's nice to say, but what, what is next? You know, what's coming next? So I'm going to go through a few things that I think are probably, they're on the radar now, and we should, we should be looking at them. But actually, they're probably, you know, if you're looking at what can you turn into the industry of the future in 5, 10, 20 years' time, you know, even the things I'm talking about today probably aren't going to cut it, but that's why, you know, you want to do startups uh, to find the answers. Um, I can't give them to you. And I think I'm going to also go through some examples of, of how expertise has built up in, in certain places to show you that it's possible. The way I think we should all be thinking about the world is that it's hackable now. Everything is hackable. The more and more of the world is becoming digital, the more that becomes digital, the more you can reprogram it. So, you know. A phone used to be a phone. Now a phone is a, is a PC in your pocket. You, know, you can do all kinds of things to it. You can reprogram it. You can tell it what to do. Um, you know, There's Arduino electronics. I don't know who's familiar with this, but you know, it's, it's a hardware kit that you can hack and you can make it do all kinds of crazy stuff. In the future, I think you know, we've got things that we can hack now. I think there's a lot that we can hack in the future. In fact, this is a, a, a lovely pie chart of everything in the world. Um, the, this is everything in the world that you can hack. 
or that you will be able to hack in the next few years. Um, there's a little red dot here that's slightly deeper than the rest. I think that's genius and inspiration, which I don't think you'll be able to hack straight away, but one day we'll get there. You, I don't know, you plug something into your brain and, wow, you know, I'm gone, I'm done, I'm brilliant. And I'm not just talking about this kind of stuff. You know, this is, uh, I think this is actually a VCR, you know, but somebody mucking around with the insides. I'm not talking about that kind of technology hacking. I'm talking about other stuff too. I'm talking about shoes. These shoes were printed. These were not made. These were not put together by anyone. These came out, somebody put in a design and printed it out. I don't think they're particularly comfortable by the looks of them. I haven't tried them myself. But, you know, um, you know, this is a technology. This is something that's talk, you know, you put in some zeros and ones into a computer and that's what you can get. You know, this is the kind of stuff I think we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about food. Um, I'm not sure what this burger will taste like, but I think in the future, maybe recipes get digital as well. Your oven, instead of cooking, you know, instead of you putting food into it, it has a, a bunch of things inside it. You put in a recipe, it's like Star Trek, you know, press a button, bang, out it comes. A food printer. You know, what if in 30 years' time, what if a food printer was available? Could Lisbon be the centre of, you know, this industry that would be enormous? Think about it. Uh, and the human body. If we can hack everything else, why can't we hack the human body? We can. You know, we already do stuff like transplants. But with, you know, the genetics uh, advances that we're seeing, all kinds of things are possible. So, you know, think big. Think about a future where everything is Lego. You know, every aspect of your life can be taken apart and put back together. What would it be to be the Lego of the world, you know, of real stuff that people use every day? Try and maybe try and be that company or have that ambition. So, you know, what do, what do I actually mean? What am I talking about? Um, I'm going to talk about an industry that's changed a lot in the last few years, mobile. So this is the first commercially available mobile phone ever. Um, you could get car phones before that, but you couldn't buy them off the shelf. This one you could buy in Japan. Stick it in your car. It's brilliant. Look at it. That's the future. That was the future in 1980. Um, today, back to that, you know, it's an amazing device, does all kinds of things. That's happened in, you know, this 30-year span. You know, we've gone from one thing to the next. Uh, uh, tremendous advances. That's coincided with something else. So Shenzhen is a place in China. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but I'm assuming ev everyone in here has a phone in their pocket, probably. If you haven't, put your hand up. No, OK. Oh, one there. You're crazy. Where is it? Sitting somewhere. It's given it, you've given it to someone else, right? Um, who's got an iPhone? Hands up. Uh, about, you know, who's got an Android phone? OK. So that's pretty much everyone is one or the other. There's, a few crazy Nokia people or something, I don't know. But um, all of you, uh, all of you, all of those phones will have been made in Shenzhen. Um, doesn't look like much, does it? So f this is 1980, fishing village. It's just over the border from Hong Kong. It was shit. I mean, you know, this is an American tourist who took these photos in 1980. Um, this is Shenzhen today, right? Shenzhen has gone from being a fishing village of about, you know, 500 people to being a city of 10 million people in that time span. In the same time that mobile phones have gone from being, you know, some clunky shit that you have in your car to something that, that can uh, answer questions when you speak to it, Shenzhen has gone from that to that. Um, and it's no coincidence, absolutely no coincidence. Politically, Deng Xiaoping uh, made this happen, but What's happened at the time is that Shenzhen has become the world's leading center for electronics production. They put every effort into becoming the one place that everyone in the world goes to get this stuff made. So to give you an idea of that growth, this is London versus Shenzhen over the past, uh, I think this is 150 years. So, you know, London's population, you can see, you know, grows pretty strongly through the Industrial Revolution, really as the British Empire, God bless its soul, uh, hits its peak. Um, it gets massive, and then the Second World War comes along, everyone leaves, and they don't come back because they're scared of being bombed, and then they realize it's crap. Uh, that was my family. And um, flattens off in the 80s, and then starts to grow again a little bit. Hey, Shenzhen, starts here, gone. It's past London already. So 
That kind of graph is astounding, I think. Now, what Shenzhen has, um, when you're talking about, you know, what does having mobile phone expertise mean? Well, okay, there are millions of, there are thousands of factories where millions of people work and they build stuff and they know how to build stuff. And if you want, if you want to get a phone built or a piece of technology built, if you're Apple or Google, you go to these guys and you say, what can you do? You don't, you don't necessarily go and say, I want this. You say, what can you do? Tell me, and then we'll work out a way to turn it into a product. This is a shopping mall in Shenzhen um, when I visited a year or two ago. Uh, you know, this is a bunch of people. You take your phone up to them. You ask them to do something to your phone, to hack it, to make it do something else, to change some element about it. Uh, and, you know, these are just ordinary guys, you know, uh, probably all under 25. They know how to hack your phone. They know how to do all kinds of stuff. Um, the thing is, this is one stall, one shop, in a shopping mall that's got 10 floors, I think, um, and there are maybe 60 of these shops on each floor. They know their stuff, right? And everyone goes there to get stuff done. You can go and buy parts from there, you can go and do all kinds of things. Lots of business gets done here. This is expertise on a really, you know, on the ground level. This is ordinary people who know amazing stuff that you, are, you and I would happily pay for. And what that's turned, that's created this industry called Shanzai. Now, Shanzai is Chinese for um, like mountain bandit. It's like a pirate, you know, it's somebody who's uh, out there and a bit crazy. Um, and Shanzai is a, is a sort of spin-off of all this mobile phone expertise. So if you, if you work in a factory and you know how to build mobile phones, you know all the ins and outs, you know all this amazing stuff, why do it for Apple? Why not do it for yourself? So what they do is they copy. So on the left here, we have a, a first-generation iPhone. On the right, I think we have a first-generation HiPhone. Um, it looks quite similar. It's basically the same product, and it's built by people who built the iPhone, left Foxconn, um, which is the company that does all the building, and did it themselves. You know, and they sell these rip-offs in shops. You can buy them. They're a lot cheaper, so they sell a lot more because Apple is expensive. And it's also customized for the Chinese market in a way that Apple products aren't. So a lot of people go and buy them. But it's not just straight up copies. Um, you can do other weird stuff too. So this is the iPhone Air. Uh, this is maybe not the most innovative thing ever because basically I've just slapped an Apple on it. But you know, people said, I want an Apple phone, but I want a flip phone. And Apple aren't going to make a flip phone, so somebody did, and they sold it. You know. um, we've also got other stuff. Uh, hey, I like taking photos with my phone, but the camera's not good enough. I'll tell you what, why don't we do that? Looks dumb, but you know, people buy it because it serves a purpose, and that's Shanzai all over. Um, and this is probably the biggest, the best example of Shanzai. I don't know if you can see, but you know, this, this says here iPhone. If you ever come across an iPhone with two SIM card slots, it's not real. It's not a real iPhone because they don't have them. This happens all the time in China and in quite a lot of emerging economies. People like to have two SIM card slots in their phone because then they can get two phone numbers and two price plans. So they have free calls in the morning on one, and they have free calls in the evening on another. So basically, they switch between the two numbers and they never pay for a phone call. It's brilliant, right? It's, that's hacking the system. Except, of course, you know, phone operators do not want you to hack the system. They want you to pay. So, um, so phone companies, Will never let, or they never let this happen. You know, people would say, "I want to, the two SIM card thing, brilliant," uh, and you know, Vodafone or whoever would say, "You must be kidding me. We're not doing this. Uh, go and do it somewhere else." So Shanzai steps in. Shanzai manufacturers say, "Well, we'll stick two SIM card slots in. We'll do it for you, and we'll make it look like an iPhone as well. How about that?" Um, but. Uh, but the interesting thing is now, you know, and, and these sell by the ton because people love it. People want to do it. It's cheaper to do this than it is to have, you know, have an expensive price plan. And uh, when I, I was reporting a story about Shanzai for Wired, and uh, I went and talked to lots of people about what they do, and this quote's really stuck with me. This was a guy who, um, he's a designer who, who works in a Shanzai company. He didn't want his name being published, obviously, because. The legal aspects of it are slightly dodgy. But um, he said, you know, there are two things going on, two levels of design in China. The first one is that we copy the Western market. We learn everything we can. We, we understand it better than anybody in the world. The second thing is we exceed what they've done. They won't go places, we go places. 
They'll, they won't do things, we'll do things. We'll, we'll make it better in a way that people want. So, you know, Shanzai is, is this crazy, incredible industry. And what's happened now is that it's starting to bleed back into traditional industry. So, for example, Nokia is now selling dual SIM phones. Because who wants to turn down, you know, millions of people buying handsets? Nokia wants to sell handsets. It really needs to sell handsets. Why not make a dual SIM one? It decided the operators were less important than the customers, which is quite nice, I think. And it said, you know, dual SIM will make it. So you're starting to get this thing where the expertise is all in one place. The knowledge is all in one place. Everything there is one place. And you get people hacking, and you get people modifying, you get people changing. And eventually, it comes back, and it changes the industry that it started with. You know, and, and it becomes this, not entirely virtuous, but this amazing cycle that changes things and changes the way things are done. So I think Shanzai is pretty interesting. Um, and I started thinking, well, what if you can Shanzai everything? Everything. What if you can, if the whole world becomes hackable, what if the whole world becomes Shanzaiable as well? What if, you can, what if you can pirate everything and mess around with it? So I'm going to take you through, through a few things that I think are the kind of industries that we should be looking at. And we should be thinking, hang on, if we become the Shenzhen of X, we can know everything, we can do everything, we can hack it, we can modify it, we can change it, and we can bring it back to the beginning. So here's a few. Artificial intelligence. A few years ago, crap. People have been working on this for years, right? Last few years, a few advances. A few years ago, you know, we'd have Gary Kasparov storming off when he got beaten by an IBM computer at chess. He didn't like it very much. That's, I mean, that's artificial intelligence, but it's, I don't know how many people play chess all the time you know, all day long. Is that the most useful thing you can do? Not really. But, you know, artificial intelligence, it's in your phone. It's in cars, increasingly. Google's self-driving car now has a license to drive around Nevada on its own. Um, you know, this stuff is advancing very fast. So what if you became the Shenzhen of artificial intelligence? What if you became the Shenzhen of material science? You know, we often talk about the space program and how lots of amazing things like Teflon and sort of weird materials with crazy properties and, uh, and stuff have come out of the space program. But what if you could be the Shenzhen of materials, of those crazy materials? What if you became the Shenzhen? This is aerogel, right? I don't know how many people have ever held aerogel. This is an incredibly strong sort of plasticky material. But it, a, a lump like this weighs, it's like a feather, weighs nothing, right? So, and it's semi-translucent. You can make it more translucent. You lose a little bit of strength. But, you know, this is a piece of aerogel, a, what, a few millimeters thick. This is holding up. Uh, I couldn't get this in the slide, but this is like a six-foot-high stack of granite. Um, and that aerogel is, you know, that thin, and it's holding the thing up. It's under no pressure. It's an amazing property. It's got amazing properties. It's an amazing material. What if you could be the Shenzhen of stuff like that? What if you could be the Shenzhen of rapid prototyping? So I showed the shoes earlier on that you printed out in a machine. Um, you know, rapid prototyping, which is this sort of 3D printing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but you, you sort of you, you pipe material out of a printer and it builds stuff. Um, you know, architects used to use cardboard to do models. Now they use 3D printing because they can just design the whole thing. <laughs> there you go. Ten minutes later, you have the building. And it's... It's one full piece. So, you know, this is not a woven basket. This is a printed, this is one single print. Um, it comes out of the machine fully formed like that. Um, this one is a flute, a fully operational flute. Um, it's made of a sort of plastic resin, but people are developing new materials and new ways of doing it. You know, you just you put in the program, do a do, bang, your flute comes out, you can start playing straight away. Um, you know, what if you could be the Shenzhen of rapid prototyping? What if you could be the Shenzhen of uh, bio, biofab? So, you know, the human body, the body, biology. What if you can hack it? A few years ago, people cloned Dolly the sheep for the first time. This stuff's advancing incredibly fast. This is some weird goo um, uh, developed by NASA. And I think this, this helps heal human skin, but it also glows in the dark. Um, I'm sure there must be, maybe there's a use in space or something, I don't know. But, um, but you know, this, you can experiment with this stuff. You can make it, you can give it all kinds of properties that you couldn't give it before. 
Um, what if you can be the Shenzhen of, of that? This is Dr. Anthony Atala from Wake Forest University in the USA in North Carolina. He's talking at TED. Um, I don't know if you can see, but he's holding something in his hand. I don't know who's seen this talk on TED. What he's got in his hand there, that's a kidney. It's a human kidney that he's basically printed. You know? So they do, they do a sort of biological scaffolding. They set up the, the basics. And then he's developed ways of you get new human cells to join onto it and to grow. And he's got kidneys. Kidneys, real kidneys that he's built himself that eventually will be implanted into people. You know, we may no longer need transplants because you just grow one and stick it in you. What if you can be the Shenzhen of that? Imagine being, imagine that being the industry that, you know, instead of thinking, oh, Silicon Valley is about technology, that's fucking technology, right? Imagine if you, if this place, if another place became the center of that. Plus, you know, this isn't as far away. These are all real things that are really happening. So maybe actually this stuff is not what you need to think about. Maybe it's the next thing after that or taking it a bit further. But if you are interested in this, it's all becoming available on a really cheap, cheap, cheap way of doing it. So you can experiment. You can use Arduino and do lots of hardware hacking. You can buy amazing new materials like Aerogel from uh, sites like Inventables. I suggest if, you're into, if you like the idea, you go and look at Inventables because there's some insane shit up there. Um, or you can go to Alibaba, which is essentially a marketplace for Chinese manufacturing. So you say what you want. I'd like a bicycle, please. A hundred bicycles. Uh, people bid on it and say they'll build you the bike to your specifications. You press a button, you pay. A couple of months later, you get a shipping container full of bicycles designed perfectly and manufactured to your specifications. So imagine if you can use that to do something else. But like I said, that's, that's all now, right? This is all stuff that's going on now. Just imagine what can happen next. Just imagine that 20, year, uh, that 20 or 30 year Shenzhen from a fishing village to the center of the phone world. Just imagine you know, Silicon Valley from you know, a couple of guys making some microchips to being the technology center of the world. Just imagine if you can, if you can take London versus Shenzhen, and you say, oh, actually, this isn't about London versus Shenzhen. This is about then versus now. You know, we don't need to start at the beginning to overtake them at the end. We need to work out a different way of doing it. We need to think about old versus new. This is, you know, this is them. And this, this needs to be us. This needs to be you. Uh, you need to overtake them, find the way to do it. So I think if you do all of that and you think about the future a lot, then you can win the future. Thank you very much.